5.30, so I will call tonight's EDA meeting to order. Karen, could we have a roll call, please? Member Roberts? Here. Member Huntosh? Here. Member Husnick? Here. Member Finneman? Here. Member Lorge? Here. Member Erickson? Here. And President Bain? Here. And our next item this evening is the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to invite everyone to join us for the pledge. If you'd like to shut off your camera before you rise for the pledge, you can do so in the bottom left of your Zoom tray. I pledge allegiance, allegiance. To, to the, the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and, to the, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. <laughs> Members of the EDA, we have an agenda before you this evening. And before I ask for a motion to approve the agenda, we do have a couple of members of the downtown beautification group here tonight and would just like to slightly modify the agenda to allow for public comment, a public comment period um, during the um, downtown sculpture purchase action item, which is item number seven. So just a slight modification to allow for public comment. And with that, I would look for a motion to approve our slightly modified agenda. I would move to approve. I'll second. I have a motion from member Finneman and a second from member Huntosh. And Karen, could we have a roll call please? Member Roberts. Aye. Member Huntosh. Member Huntosh. Aye. Member Snick. Aye. Member Finneman. Aye. Member Lorge? Aye. Member Erickson? Aye. And President Bain? Aye. Agenda is approved. Our next item this evening is to approve the minutes from our regular meeting of March 22nd, 2021. I will entertain any changes or a motion to approve. I move we approve. I'll second that. We have a motion from Member Lorge and a second from Member Finneman. And Karen, could we have another roll call, please? Member Roberts? Aye. Member Huntash? Abstain. Member Husnick? Aye. Member Finneman? Aye. Member Lorge? Member Lorge? Aye. And Member Erickson? Yeah. And President Bain? Aye. Minutes approved. Our next item this evening is the downtown incentive application or downtown um, incentive program application. And Dan, I believe you're walking us through this. Uh, President, members of the EDA, um, before you tonight are two applications uh, for the downtown incentive program. Uh, the first one, is for 131 Lake Street North, which is the Fireside Getaway Building. And the second one is for 119 Lake Street North, which is the old theater building. Um, I've reviewed both applications that they've uh, that have come in. Uh, I'll go through them individually tonight. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll give my recommendations um, on the uh, two applications. Um, the first one, 131 Lake Street North, um, this is the, uh, the new fireside getaway building. Um, the applicant has completed improvements uh, to, that, to the exterior of the building that are, are in excess of the $40,000 required by the program. Um, this is a, a combination of work that was both contracted out and work that was done by the owners themselves. And then they submitted their hours um, to the city for, for that work um, that they did themselves. Um, they did submit records and as well as photographs of the before and after of all the work that they completed or uh, completed to the outside of the building. Um, and there is a breakdown of what uh, work was done that's included in the memo. Um, that work included um, a new signage on the front and rear of the building, uh, standing of the deck in the rear of the building, um, some landscape upgrades, as well as um, 
painting of the building, both the front and the rear of the building. Um, th there is, if you look at the breakdown that's included, there's a slight variance between that and what's on the original application. Um, that was when I went back out to the applicant, I asked for more specific information than just sort of a lump sum, you know, uh, exterior improvements and I got the breakdown. So there is a little bit of a discrepancy from the original application to that breakdown, but the breakdown, all that work in there has been verified as completed. Um, they are asking for the full $5,000 incentive um, for, the, for the building located at 131 Lake Street North. Um, the application for 119 Lake Street North, um, this is related to the old theater building's demolition. So the downtown incentive program has two, two components to it. The first component is for exterior improvements and there's also a component for building demolition. Um, what they're asking for for the old theater building is basically pre-approval of the of the incentive program, um, and that pre-approval will, will be contingent upon them actually completing the, the demolition of the of the uh, of the building. Um, as we all know, work has not yet been completed on the demolition. The building is still there, so work has not been completed on the old theater building. And then payment uh, for this, if it is pre-approved tonight, would only be issued. When the demolition is complete and all of the demolition permits for the project are closed out by the city and the partnering agencies. Um, these demolition permits sometimes do also require permits from, from MnDOT for right for you know getting into the right of way for utility shutoffs, uh, watershed permits, etc. We want to make sure all of those are closed out prior to the payments being issued and the demolition is fully complete. Um, I did enclose a list of typical demolition requirements, just so the EDA is aware that this is a little bit more than just knock the building down, you get $5,000. There's quite a list of, of check boxes that have to be completed before that payment does get issued. Um, it is recommended for the pre-approval of this. And if, if we do a pre-approval pre of this, that we do an expiration of 2022. Reason for that is we don't want to do a pre-approval and have that be that pre-approval never sunset. We want to make sure that we have a, a date that we know they have to complete the work by um, based on this application. Um, if they don't complete the work by 2022, they can come back and get a renewal on that um, pre-approval. We want to put some type of sunset in there. So this, uh, this is not just sit out there, you know, on the books for, you know, 10 or 15 years. You know, so by putting that sunset in, it gives them approximately 16 or actually 20 months to complete it. So almost two years to complete the, actually, excuse me, a year and a half to complete the work. So plenty of time to get the demolition project started. I mean, and again, if they don't complete it within that, you know, time period, they can come back in and um, ask for a renewal of that pre-approval. Um, at this point, uh, staff is recommending approval of the incentive for 131 uh, Lake Street North, uh, the Fireside Getaway Building in the amount of $5,000. Um, staff is also recommending the pre-approval of the incentive for 119 Lake Street North pending successful completion of the demolition project and closeout of the demolition permit. Um, no payment for the 119 Lake Street North will be made prior to the closeout of all required demolition <laughs> permits. And it, again, it's recommended, recommended that this uh, pre-approval expire at the end of 2022. Um, just for the EDA's uh, awareness, these two incentive programs uh, applications are budgeted for in 21. We did anticipate these coming on. So the budget, we are budgeted for these two incentive programs. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the EDA has uh, regarding the incentive applications. Member Finneman, go ahead. In the discussion so far, has there been any discussion about when the uh, old theater building is demolished, what the short term use will be for that piece of property and whether there's retaining walls and other things involved relative to sitting next to uh, the public right away on 61. We have had some initial conversations, you know, with the building owner um, and basically had stated that if you demo the building with a building permit, you'd go right from demolition to construction. And that's typically how, you know, a lot of times these building demolitions or redevelopments happen. If they want to stage it where they do the demolition first and then sit on a vacant lot for a, a time period before they get the capital to do the, the construction, we would require that the lot be left in a safe manner. We're not going to allow them to put some snow fencing in there or some type of fencing to allow an unsafe condition in downtown. So they are aware that they have to do the grading of that to ensure that 
is graded in a way that it is safe for uh, pedestrian traffic and, and residents to walk up and down 61 on the sidewalk there. So we're not gonna let them leave an open hole there. Um, part of the permitting would be that they have to uh, finish off the landscaping requirements as, as part of the demolition permit closeout. Do you know if they intend to use the raw property, however it is protected as parking for the short term? They have not come forward with any formal application at this point. I'd have to defer to the applicant or the owner at this point as to what their plans are, are for it. Um, they just had asked as they start moving forward with their demolition projects to see if they couldn't get the pre-approval here, just so they have some assurances that once they complete the demolition, that they would be you know, authorized to get this $5,000. Yeah, and I have no challenge to that at all. I'm just curious about the interim part after it's been demolished. Um, I suppose that answers all the questions. There's no really sunset to this part of it, is there? They could clear the site, protect the site, even use the site, uh, but not really have to rebuild until, for example, planning is done and uh, times change and there's more opportunity in the future. Correct. As long as it's left in a safe, you know, in a, in a, in a manner that's safe and, you know, we're not just letting a hole sit downtown, you know, we want to make sure that they're leaving it in a, in a usable or, you know, in a, in a safe condition after demolition is completed. Okay, I'm good. Dan, if we were to approve um, the uh, kind of the pre-approval of the demolition tonight, are they allowed to within our program to also apply for a subsequent grant on actual construction or other site improvements or is the program limited to $5,000 per, per location? I believe it's five thousand dollars per per location. I, they would qualify for the reduced permit fees. Um, we've okay. done those for multiple applications, but you get one one incentive per per address or per per lot. Understood. Other questions for Dan this evening on the uh, <clears throat> member Erickson. Go ahead. Dan, um, remind me how many of these incentives do we budget for each year? Is it two? Typically it's two. Um, the original, when this was originally passed, kind of pre-work plan back and I believe it was 16 or 17, I think they budgeted for up to, or they capped it at $30,000 a year. At the, that was the original cap. But right now, just given what we're seeing in the demand side of it, we're seeing approximately two a year. Um, this year at the last meeting I, I did, when I updated the budget, at, uh, allocated funds for three of these because there was another one that I'd heard rumor that might be coming in. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that we could potentially entertain that one as well. But we're seeing typically anywhere between one to three a year, but for the most part, one or two is what we're seeing. Okay, that's really what I was wondering is if we approve both of these, you know, is there still room in the budget to entertain others, especially if this doesn't, the second one doesn't pay out till 22? And, and, and that's a great point. If the second one, you know, the demolition potentially could take a while for them to go through all the permitting process to complete that work. So this one may actually not pay out till 2022. So, you know, there's still the possibility that two more could come in that could still get pre-approved. So it's sort of a moving target, but I'm watching all those numbers as everything kind of comes in and trying to be, you know, responsive to those applications as they come in. Perfect, thanks. Member Husnick. Uh, Mara and everyone, um, have they gotten a solid bid on that demolition work? I mean, do they know what they're getting into there, I guess, and, and making sure that the job is completed the way it's uh, described and that kind of thing? Dan, do you know anything about that? or? Yeah, they have submitted a couple of bids as part of this. They do, in speaking with them, they do have bids. Um, they know there's some abatement work that needs to be done in the building as well. So I believe they have bids for that. So they do know, and we, we've you know communicated with the owner that, you know, these sometimes get a little bit bigger than just the city permits that you have to reach out to MnDOT and make sure everything's sort of coordinated and we're willing to assist with that kind of letting them know what they're getting into. So they're going in with eyes wide open, not necessarily eyes wide shut. So we are working with the applica applicant on that. We just, we just want a nice clean job of it when it's done, you know, that's all. So thank you. It is a big project, that is for sure. Other questions of the project or for Dan, <laughs> Member Roberts. Yeah, is, are there any other incentives out there for something like this? We all know that not all, but most of us know the history of that building, and and this is a, a, a benefit to downtown. I think to finally get that that piece taken care of and taken down, and hopefully development happens at some point. But any other incentives we can do to help them uh, maybe speed that process up so it's not sitting much longer? I have looked pretty extensively to see what programs this one would qualify for. And given that it's in private hands, there's not a lot of programs that this one fits, you know, there's not a lot of grant programs that are currently on the market, but I have 
looked at quite a few different programs, reached out to different agencies to see if there's anything that we can do. And I have not seen anything yet. Um, but if I do see something come across my desk, I'll always make sure to pass those along as I become aware of them. Thanks for taking the time to do that. And Dan, just for confirmation, you are, um, it is staff's recommendation that we um, approve, um, uh, approve the grant request and then do a preliminary approval on the second request for demolition. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Contingent upon, you know, demolition being completed and city permits being closed out. I said preliminary, better word is contingent approval on the second. Thank you for that correction. Correct. Yep. Contingent. Correct. Any other questions or anybody? Ready for a motion this evening? Mar, this this doesn't have to go in front of the council then, does it afterwards or no? Nope, this is approved okay. at the okay. ADA. All right. Uh, just process education wise, is there a demolition of this sort? Is there any sort of an EDA or a planning commission step? I know it's a little outside of lane of the EDA. Um, That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head if there is. Uh, I would assume if, if they're demolishing as part of a site, you know, a site redevelopment, it would be. Um, I'd have to look into that. I don't know off the top of my head. Thank you. Other questions or happy to entertain a motion if anyone's ready for a motion. I would move to approve the funds for both of those uh, particular sites. I do. There's, there's a motion for a motion and a, a motion from Member Finneman and a second from Member Erickson. Just a quick point of clarification that the second approval is a preliminary or a contingent approval. Is that correct? Correct. So I Very good. Any further discussion on this item? I know this project has been a long time coming for this applicant. So happy to see it moving forward and happy to support it this evening. Dan, also thanks for your work on this application and trying to um, find a, find a, some resources. It's a much needed, nice project for downtown. With that, Karen, can we have a roll call, please? Member Roberts. Aye. Member Huntash. Aye. Member Huntash. Aye. Member Husnick? Aye. I, I got you. <laughs> Sorry, um, Judy had sent me a, a chat that said she was having um, difficulties with her connection. And so if there's a little <laughs> conversation. Um, Member Lorge? Aye. Member Finneman? Aye. Member Erickson? Aye. And President Bain? Hi, motion's approved. Our next item this evening is the downtown sculpture purchase. Um, and Dan, maybe if you want to start us, start us on conversation for this, we'll take some preliminary questions and then we'll um, provide an opportunity for Connie Grabovi and Karen Moorhead to provide comment if they'd like, and then we can open it up for discussion. Absolutely. Uh, President, members of the EDA, uh, before you tonight is a consideration of the purchase of a kinetic sculpture for downtown Forest Lake. Um, kind of before I want to jump into the kind of the overall presentation, I think it's probably helpful for me to provide just a little bit of context as to why a sculpture purchase is sitting on the EDA's agenda this, this evening. I'm sure maybe a few of you are kind of wondering how does a sculpture impact the Economic Development Authority and why is this on the agenda? Um, so a little bit of context as to how we got here. Um, if you recall, recall back in, uh, it was I believe it was the spring of 2020, um, the EDA accepted a $2,000 donation um, from the Hallberg Family Foundation. Um, that donation came through or was given, was brought to the EDA through the Downtown Beautification Group. They found the funds and then gave that to the EDA. Um, the intent of that donation um, was to, that those funds were to be used to purchase public art for Downtown Forest Lake or Forest Lake. Um, I enclosed in the packet a copy of the of the resolution where the EDA accepted those funds. Um, so you can see um, exactly kind of tra trace the history of the funds uh, for the sculpture purchase. Um, so since the source of the funding for the art lies in the EDA's fund, the EDA then needs to authorize the purchase of the art. So 
that's a little bit of the inside baseball as to why the EDA tonight has a sculpture purchase um, on the agenda. Um, so now that we have, you know, kind of the funds here within the EDA, um, the downtown beautification group has worked, went out and, and found an artist to provide a sculpture and wants to expend those funds to purchase a sculpture for downtown Forest Lake. Um, there was some conversation um, as to where to actually locate this sculpture. And if you recall back when, just when the downtown committee was just getting kicked off, this came forward as one of the first items um, back in the fall of last year. And there was some conversation as to, you know, where, where, we, where would we put, you know, art in downtown Forest Lake um, at the time the downtown beautification group's preferred location was the roundabout um, where the Christmas tree goes. Um, there was some, you know, honestly, some concern from staff, just if we put a sculpture in there, is it gonna be seen? Is it gonna be too far away from where people are? Is it gonna blend into the background? Um, so we did have a conversation with the artist in the downtown beautification group and the artist assured, you know, staff that that location is still the preferred location that even though it's, not directly adjacent to, you know, people can't walk right up to it, that it won't get lost in the mix. That the, the sculpture is big enough that it will be able to be seen um, from the sidewalks adjacent uh, to the roundabout. Um, let me share my screen here quick and I'll just show exactly where they are looking to um, place this particular piece. Um, it's the area here circled in red is the roundabout right here in the center of that. That is the roundabout where they, are looking to uh, have this sculpture placed. Um, this is also the same roundabout where the Christmas tree goes. So to kind of help you get an idea of where this is, it's right next to Lakeside Memorial Park. Um, this is not the large roundabout right on 61. It's the smaller one there that's closer to the lake. Um, that is the preferred location. Um, we've had conversations, like I mentioned, with the downtown beautification group, as well as the artist. And after all of those conversations, that still kind of came back as their preferred location. So that is being presented tonight as the preferred location uh, for the sculpture. So with the, that being the uh, preferred location, uh, let me just uh, pull up exactly what the sculpture looks like here. Because I think for some people here, this may be the first time that everybody is seeing it. So what they are proposing to purchase is a this sculpture right here, something that looks very similar to what's here presented before you tonight. Um, overall size of this when it's fully constructed will be nine feet tall uh, by five and a half feet wide. Um, the materials are going to be steel and, and as well as copper and all of it will be sealed or painted. Um, one little difference in, in speaking with the artist, the blue that's on here won't be this kind of teal blue. It'll be actually the, the same color blue that the light poles in downtown Forest Lake are painted. So they're going to take that color element and apply it to this piece to tie it in by, better with the rest of the metal or the pieces that are downtown Forest Lake. Um, and as far as I understand it, and, and Connie or Karen, could, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe all of these pieces move or they rotate around um, the sculpture um, with the wind. They do. So there is a, 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 an aspect of movement with this sculpture as well. Um, approximate weight is right around 35 pounds. So, in the need arises, if we do need to move this, we are able to move this um, sculpture as needed. Um, switching gears slightly onto the maintenance side of it, one of the concerns that we had from a staff's perspective was say, we're moving this to install or take it out you know, annually and we damage it, a fish you know, gets bent or broken, are we able to get it fixed? You know, that's always a concern when you're purchasing art. Can you fix it? Um, the artist has maintained all of the templates for all of these fish. So in the, you know, if there is, the sculpture gets damaged or if, you know, somebody does vandalize the sculpture, we are able to get replacement pieces directly from the artist. She says she is able to create them and come back out and get those installed back on there. So there is that ability. So if it's purchased, it's not just going to kind of fall in disrepair if we lose a piece, we are able to maintain that sculpture uh, moving forward as well. Um, overall cost uh, for this, the cost of the sculpture um, is $1,500. Um, I also reached out to Public Works and asked what the installation costs are, because we also have to be, it's not only just the purchasing of the sculpture, but also making sure that we have the materials to get it installed into the ground. 
Uh, Public Works estimates that the installation of the piece will be right around five hundred dollars, uh, give or take. Uh, that's time and materials to get it installed. So when you add the fifteen hundred for the sculpture and the five hundred for the installation, that would uh, expend all of the grant funds or the donation that we received for Public Art, uh, you know, from the Hallberg Family Foundation. Um, also on the on the maintenance side too, uh, that was a, a big piece I did ask because I was just concerned. You know, what is, you know, what does the artist anticipate the maintenance to be? You know, just generally, and she said the biggest thing would just be painting of the poles, making sure the paint stays fresh. You know, she said everything else there is built to last. This piece does have it's designed to withstand the elements, um, and the painting would be the one main thing that she said would be probably the biggest maintenance piece that's required for this piece. Um, given that the location of it is in the same roundabout that the Christmas tree is located in, this will need to get removed every fall and installed back in the spring. So we don't have any, so we're able to get the Christmas tree installed there, um, in the, over the winter time. Um, the artist again says the way that this is installed, it's easy for public works to go out there, do the removals in the fall and then install it back in the spring. Um, I did confirm with Public Works that they are able to do that, you know, without any major challenges to their workflows. And they said, no, they'd be able to take care of the installation removal um, without any major lift on their end. So not a big deal there. Um, last little piece of what are the next steps in this process? Because again, not that it's already complicated enough trying to figure out how the EDA is purchasing art, but to try to add one more kind of sticky wicket to this whole thing. Um, since this is actually going to go on to a city owned roundabout, we actually have to get city council to approve or authorize the location and give the final blessing of the location of this. So what's being asked tonight is a conditional a purchase approval. And that condition of purchase is contingent on city council authorizing the installation of it in the roundabout. Uh, so that's a little bit of background on this piece. Uh, I would like to close in just mentioning that with this piece, if this piece is purchased and installed, um, it's not done so using tax dollars. It all it will be done using that donation. So there aren't no, there aren't any tax dollars that are going to be allocated to this project. It all comes in via that private donation from the Hallberg Family Foundation. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to turn it over to either Connie or Karen to, uh, or actually any questions of me, then I can turn it over to Connie and Karen for any follow up. Go ahead, Member Finneman. You just mentioned that you. Take it out in the fall and put it back up in spring but the christmas tree is the only thing that defers it away is that christmas tree up for that significant amount of time or is this just going to be a six month uh sculpture we get to see it for six months worth of time uh it's not already on a pedestal i believe a sil you know some sort of concrete base uh can we not put it up even during the winter take it down and put it up in the winter just not there during the tree time I think uh, theoretically we could. The only concern I would have with that is that you're putting it in an area where there's also gonna be salt in the winter time adjacent to that. And if the pole is being steel, you just could potentially add some maintenance expenses because yeah, as we all know, salt and steel don't necessarily always get along the best. And if it's gonna get removed for the Christmas tree, it might help the longevity of it just to have it pulled for the winter time and then put back into the spring. Does the city store it then? Yeah, and we've had, we would have, we have locations to, to store it. Okay. Well, it's unfortunate it has to be gone for such a long period of time, but I understand the consideration for decay due, due to salt. And I, and I think the Christmas tree starts to go up right before Thanksgiving. So there's not that much time. If we take it out in that November, it wouldn't be that much time before the Christmas tree is there. So we would try to maximize usage of the, of the piece in the roundabout. Other questions for Dan at this time? All right, like uh, member Roberts, go ahead. So first I'd like to thank the beautification committee for uh, doing all the work on this. It, it's kind of unique sculpture, it'd be a nice addition to downtown. Um, this I think was delayed a little bit based on the city wanting to have an overall policy as to where a donated art or such items like this are placed or is placed. So, uh, and where are we at with that? Has that been already been done? And that's why we're moving forward with this at this point? Where is that all at? Uh, that is still being worked on in process. That's still in process. We have not finalized the public art monument policy, um, but also 
you know, didn't want to delay an installation of this piece as a result of policy development, considering we had a piece that was here. So sort of decoupled those two and said, this one could kind of go down a, a unique one-off track, you know, but moving forward, we do want to get a public monument policy in place. So we have a very clear pathway for how do we handle public art installations in the city. So we don't always have to kind of go through and, you know, again, the process is working right now, but it's sort of, if you look at it, it's a little bit jumbled in terms of council approval, EDA approval, where everything is. And it's clear if we can get that policy in place, that'll clear that up. But right now we don't have that completed at this point. Well, it's good to have a plan, but I'm glad that it was decoupled and then we're moving forward with this. I agree. I think it's also unusual that you have a funding source before a project. A lot of times these projects, you know, kind of take shape and then there's a funding mechanism or a funding effort. And so, um, especially since we had funding available, it's good to see it move forward. With that, um, so Connie Grabovi and Karen Moorhead, thank you for being here tonight. And thank you for all of the efforts of the downtown beautification group. Anything else you'd like to add or you'd like the EDA to consider? this evening? Well, I would just like to thank Dan and uh, the mayor for meeting with us and for listening to our concerns and helping address some of the roadblocks we ran into during this process. And I mean, we're all very excited. So we're looking forward to this project coming to a completion and for the day that it's installed, because I think it is really going to be enjoyed. And it's something that um, everyone in the city can appreciate and it's maybe something that we can have a future with that design for the city and the businesses downtown. So we're very excited about it. And thank you. Oh, I just add my thank you to that, to Dan and, and the people that have met with the sculptors. I think everyone that has met her, I know we are, and I think Dan is very impressed with the detail that she goes into before she offers a project like this. And so again, to Mark, we put the fish under the ice in the winter for the ice fishermen. And then we'll bring it out again when the fish are out. And one of the one of the neat things is the fish that she's using are all fish that are located within our lake. And so again, just that personal touch coming down Broadway to be able to see that. I'm I'm just so thankful that this is moving forward and all the work that's been done on it. Any other questions of the group? With that, I would I would entertain a motion for approval if anyone is ready. I would move to approve. I, love it. I think we all. By the way, and I'll second it. I hear a motion from Member Finneman and a second from Member Huntosh. Any further discussion on this item? Just add gratitude to all that's been involved in this project and um, Connie and Karen. I hope you come back for council approval next week. I have. Just two minor, Dan mentioned as part of his discussion, um, just two minor points that I have heard. Um, so some co concern over questions around which roundabout, and again, this is the roundabout that is closest to the park, um, to the east, it is not the primary roundabout at 61 and um, Broadway. And then secondly, that it is paid for entirely by the Hallberg Family uh, Foundation and our gratitude to them to make this possible. So um, there are no general fund, there's no general fund or EDA fund impact to this project. So happy to, um, happy to support it this evening. Any further discussion items? Just, All right. I can, oh, just Dan, have one point of clarity on the, on the motion. I just wanna make sure everybody's aware that it is contingent. The purchase is, is contingent on council approval. Is that correct? Sure, motion, uh, contingent motion. Okay, perfect. And Karen, could we have a roll call, please? Member Roberts. Aye. Member Huntash. Aye. Member Husnick. Aye. Member Finneman. Aye. Birch. Aye. Member Erickson? Aye. And President Bain. Hey, motion's approved. Our next item this eve, thank you. Our next item this evening, um, and we have an um, Chris Ang with an update on the Minnesota Technology Corridor. Chris, thank you for being here. Welcome. 
Thank you, President Bain and members, good evening. Uh, Dan had asked me if I would give a quick update on the Minnesota Technology Corridor. And <clears throat> if it's okay, I'll ask Dan and Patrick to weigh in if I miss something. So uh, just kind of a little background for you. It's been a while since we've talked about this, but it is an ongoing partnership with Conexus Energy, um, Anoka County and Washington County. And then also the five cities of Forest Lake, Hugo, Columbus, Lionel Lakes and Centerville. And that partnership is still strong. It's as strong today as it was when we created it originally. Um, the purpose of the uh, technology corridor is to attract technology-based businesses into the area and into the state of Minnesota. Um, there isn't anybody else in the state of Minnesota that's doing this type of a collaborative partnership on a regional basis. So we feel like we're well poised to uh, attract companies here to Minnesota. And Minnesota does have some very nice incentives that uh, we can offer, especially to data centers that are looking at relocating and establishing here in Minnesota. And we wanted to be prepared for that. Uh, we do have a website and the website is up to date. It's the mntechcorridor.com. And we are also doing pu uh, publications and monthly articles using social media to get the word out on why companies should consider the Minnesota Technology Cor uh, Corridor as part of, their mar part of our marketing effort and a, and a way for us to attract um, businesses here into the corridor. And candidly, it's been a little slow. Uh, COVID kind of put a kibosh on, on a lot of businesses considering doing anything for the time being. So honestly, no dirt moving yet within the corridor, but we are getting a number of inquiries and that's picking up a little bit. In fact, uh, just during the month of March alone, we had over 40 hits on the website. So we feel like that we're making good progress, um, albeit it's um, a little bit slower in April now, but um, we still feel confident that we are well poised to be able to respond to inquiries as they come in. And the first point of contact is through the website. And of course, uh, through CBRE, who has the, uh, the headwater site listed for sale. I'll also talk a little bit about the LIDAR study. If you remember about a year ago, Conexus Energy was generous enough to um, help us fund um, a very uh, in-depth LIDAR study. And it's, it's actually a pretty detailed study that we will make available upon request to a site selector, to a company that's looking for very specific engineering type information on the site. And that was a grant that we did receive from Conexus Energy and the city did match that. And so that uh, is something that we're using as a marketing tool to, to let site selectors know not only have we identified an area and a site, but we've got really detailed information that we can provide. And um, it just gives us that ability to respond a lot quicker once we do get that inquiry. Conexus Energy did also uh, fund recently a study in the city of Centerville by a company called Excipio. And Excipio has a lot of relationships with data centers and site selectors, especially as it relates to competitiveness. And you know, if a, if a data center does re relocate and expand in an area, they wanna make sure that it's gonna be profitable. Well, the study that Excipio did for Centerville found out that not only are we, are only are we competitive, but um, within this corridor, and it's specifically in the site in Centerville, the um, financial returns to a data center were almost double of what they were in other states and in other sites locally as well. So there are some really good advantages that we want to be able to share with uh, site selectors and data centers that are looking to, uh, to locate. And now that study is, is available and we would provide a contact through Excipio and they would be glad to walk anybody through that information to find out um, how a data center could be profitable in this location. And more recently, just a few weeks ago, um, we did have a meeting with all of the partners uh, with Conexus, the cities, the counties to start thinking about potential opportunities for new infrastructure. We're learning that the ARP, the American Recoveries Plan, has uh, specifically called out information for infrastructure and has highlighted broadband and, and high-speed internet as an opportunity. So we want you to kind of start thinking about ways that if those funds were made available, could we somehow use those dollars to provide broadband uh, infrastructure, other things that would um, help us get the, the tech corridor a little bit further along. So start thinking about that a little bit, just I'll put that out as a, as a challenge to you to, to find ways that we could um, uh, creatively use those dollars, those grant dollars that may be coming to, to try to uh, make some things happen within the tech corridor. And finally, just, um, just let you know that we are ready uh, to respond to inquiries and move quickly if, if they do come in and, and um, I think we're in a pretty good position. We know enough about the sites in specific so that if a site selector wants to dig in and do a little bit more information, we think that we can respond probably within a matter of days. And so we'll 
uh, we'll react to those inquiries very quickly. And if we do happen to see something come across the email or uh, we get a call from DEED or Greater MSP, which is uh, another regional partnership um, that does help us do some marketing, we will be ready, ready to respond with the Headquarters 123 site. And so with that, I'll pause and see if anybody has any questions or Dan or Patrick, if I missed anything, please feel free to add. Thank you, Chris. Dan or Patrick, anything to add? And I guess I'd just also open it up to EDA. Any questions for Chris this evening? I just, I just have a, I asked Dan Peterson from CBRE just to give us, give me a quick kind of overview of what he's seeing in the market. Um, and he kind of echoes what Chris said is there was a lot of, you know, COVID year or 2020 was a little bit slow, um, but he's kind of seen activity pick up. Um, it's been submitted you know, as part to some national searches. So our particular site has been submitted out to some national searches for um, some larger, you know, land requirements. I think these were in the ballpark of 120 to 250 acre sites. So relatively large users were looking. Um, he's still seeing a lot of hits on his, they have, a, they have their own site that they use that's specific to our headwaters listing. Um, and there's been a lot of, of hits recently that he's finding originating within the state of Minnesota. So he's seeing a lot of more regional activity on the site as well. Um, but just overall, the, all the work that we've done over the past two years, to echo what Chris said, we're now able to respond so much quicker to any, any, any inquiry that comes in. We can get information out usually within 12 hours, sometimes same day, you know, which is a huge, you know, that turnaround time is a lot shorter now than it used to be where we used to have to go out and try to assemble what they have. We kind of know what they're looking for and we can get that information out to them a lot quicker now. So, you know, A, we're getting a lot of interest in this site, but B, we're also able to respond relatively quickly to that interest. So yeah, I think it's well positioned right now. Thanks, Dan, for that additional perspective. It's helpful to see both from what's happening with the technology quarter as a kind of a regional focus and then to what's happening specifically with our site. Chris, can, do you have feedback around from the technology corridor, just what you're seeing about these types of um, projects through the state um, is, is, you know, we, we mentioned a period of slowness. Is that an unusual or is that kind of what's, what's just reflective of the broader economy and what's happening right now? Honestly, I think it's just a, a blip on the radar, a little speed bump here because of COVID. Um, but I think once we right. can get past that, I think, um, you know, we're well poised to respond quickly. And, and you know, Dan is absolutely right. Usually when we get the, the inquiries, it's it's a matter of they want to they wanna know within a couple of months if we can turn this thing fast. Um, a lot of times companies will have been in the planning stages for a number of months or even years. And when they decide to go, they're gonna to wanna to go tomorrow. And so um, I love the fact that this site is publicly owned and it's ready to go. We know a lot about it. We took a lot of the risk away for a potential developer or a site selector or a data center, for example, um, because they don't have to guess where things are at. We, we know pretty much everything about the site and can react pretty quickly. And, Hopefully, have something in the ground as, as fast as, uh, as as fast as they want to move. We'll move at their pace. Other questions for Chris? All right, Chris. Thank you for being here again. Thank you. And um, the next item on the agenda this evening is um, an update on the downtown planning schedule, Dan. Uh, president members of the EDA, just wanted to give a brief verbal update as to kind of where we are with the downtown planning process. Um, since that bid was approved uh, during the mat, the last EDA meeting, um, I did meet uh, with Bruce and Rita from HKGI just for an informal or kind of an internal kickoff meeting. Uh, right now, they're working on assembling all of the background information, all the background data for the project. So they're doing quite a bit of data mining right now getting that all assembled. Um, one thing that we did discuss was sort of doing a two-part kickoff meeting. So instead of just doing one giant kickoff meeting is kind of doing a, a, a two-part. Uh, the first part of this kickoff would be a uh, downtown meeting that's actually held downtown Forest Lake with the downtown committee. So it's more of a walk and talk type meeting where the planners would be there with members of the downtown committee 
we'd walk through downtown to try to get, you know, direct feedback from everybody, kind of an on the ground assessment of how currently downtown is. And then they would take that information back and then do the official kickoff meeting, you know, either at a virtually or an in-person setting, depending upon where we are with, you know, meeting restrictions at that point. Um, but that would be done in May or later in May would be the official kind of the larger scope uh, kickoff meeting. Um, they kind of originally proposed doing the walkabout and then the kickoff meeting in one meeting. And I was kind of like, that's going to be three to four hours by the time you get everything sort of logistically together. So looking at splitting those two off. So just to sort of get it on everybody's radar screen, the next downtown committee meeting will more likely than not be held on location in downtown uh, Forest Lake just for a walkthrough. Um, won't be a, it won't be like a three hour meeting by any means. It'll just be a walk through downtown, give direct feedback to the planners. Um, and then the official kickoff meeting will be in May. Um, the, the work that they, like I said, they're currently doing is that they're um, reviewing all the background information that they needed, that they need for the plan. And they'll bring all that, you know, kind of that, that background work. They'll bring their initial thoughts to that kickoff meeting in May. Um, one thing I did ask them, is there any downside to waiting till May to kick this off versus kind of going right after approval? And they actually said they prefer to wait a little bit so they can get a little better understanding of what the current conditions are in downtown, which is what they're using that time for, uh, for now. Um, they are excited to work on the project, excited to kick it off. Um, I did bring up, you know, how do they want to interact with this board? You know, I know Commissioner Finneman had asked, sort of how do we enter, how does he interact with the, the planners themselves? We're working through that right now. We're gonna get a clear pathway for that to work. So we have, a, I can, I'll come back with a better definition as to how that interaction between the board directly with the planners, what that will look like. Um, I do know one thing that they're hoping to do uh, for the stakeholder interviews is they're hoping to do time blocks. So rather than do kind of piecemeal, one here, one over here, one here, is they wanna to try to do say a Wednesday from 11 to five or whatever that time frame looks like, just sort of back to back to back, you know, interviews and try to get them scheduled so they can kind of do all of that in one time block. I did let them know that city hall is available for those one-on-one -on -one interactions. You know, if we need to bring the, the business owners in to do that sort of interview process, some of that fact finding, they can use uh, city hall for that. So they are aware of that. Um, but like I said, they want to kind of time block that out. So it's a more condensed time frame. So with a few select days, I'll do those interviews versus kind of throughout the process. Um, we're also working on the communication plan. Um, started working on what that communication rollout looks like both internally and externally. So we'll have that up and running here uh, shortly. Um, this, we are going to build a separate page on the city website that's specific to downtown planning that'll warehouse all of the information on what's going on with the downtown plan. And I was also able to confirm that when they start doing their kind of some of their feedback on their separate micro sites that they're going to build, I can build those directly into the city site. So when you go to the city's page, you won't have to click out of that to see the information that they're collecting. It'll show right on our site. So I'm pretty happy to hear that they're able to iframe directly into our site. So look for that site to launch in the short term as well. There's going to be a lot of information coming out on this in the near future. Uh, but just wanted to get everybody an update that there is work being done. And uh, so far it's been a, a fairly smooth process and looking forward to the uh, walkthrough at the next downtown committee meeting. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Member Finneman, go ahead. From what you just said, does that mean uh, the time period for interviews and programming with stakeholders downtown might be somewhere around mid-May? I'd have to defer to them. When I meant for time blocking, I meant that was there instead of just sort of, you know, I think it's for them to save traffic tra travel time coming out here, you know, but I don't know if they're going to start that kind of before the kickoff meeting or after I'd have to defer back to them. They are working on getting me a sort of initial schedule that's more defined because again, if you recall back when we approved the bid, the schedule that they originally presented was sort of back using that March timeframe. And now that we're back a little bit in terms of, or excuse me, February approval, they are gonna give me an updated uh, schedule. So I will be able to answer that question for you once, as soon as I get that schedule. Yeah, thanks. Other questions for Dan on the downtown plan? So Dan, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it. So given that, what is, do you have a thought for agenda for two weeks from now on 
we, we do have a downtown committee um, meeting scheduled and maybe you're not prepared to talk about that now. Um, I think at this point, the, you know, assuming weather holds, we're not dealing with six feet of snow, you know, which we potentially could at the end of February. Anything could happen. <laughs> right. If weather looks good and we're seeing good weather, the plan would be to, and I'll confirm with Bruce this week on this, but the plan would be to, to meet at Lakeside Memorial Park during that original time slotted. Obviously everybody has to maintain proper social distancing, mask up, whatever the requirements are, but then sort of do a walk through downtown as a group. And then you guys can, he'll have questions of the downtown committee, kind of more of a small scale direct feedback right to the planners um, would be that time frame. trying to keep it right around an hour or so. Cause obviously we have to be cognizant of the fact that there's a council meeting at seven o'clock um, after that downtown committee meeting. So two weeks from tonight. Sorry, yeah, two weeks from tonight, correct. Okay. Yep, yep. And if that changes, I will let the downtown committee know. That'll all go out in email once we get those details uh, nailed down. Perfect. Thank you for that. Sounds like a productive a productive evening. There's nothing like a visual to uh, start start a plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that, um, we will move on to our next agenda item this evening, which is just other city updates. Open it up to Dan and Patrick. Other things that you would like the EDA to know at this time? I have I have nothing else at this time unless there's additional questions for me. Patrick, anything further to add? And we may have lost Patrick. Um, I will just note, I know it's been a topic of uh, topic of interest for the EDA. Um, we do have on council agendas tonight the approval with um, the parent company for Stella's over to use both the parking lot and the clubhouse agreement that is on council's agenda this evening. So um, many thanks to all involved and it's nice to be, be to this point of having an agreement there. So I'm looking forward to hopefully an approval tonight on that. Nice to be at the finish line. Any other, and then we do also have a, a, a go ahead, Blake. Just uh, circling back to the headwaters 123, has, has there been any interest on non, uh, you know, what, we, what Chris was talking about? I know that the developer was interested in, at one point in buying a part of that land. Has there been any additional interest on, on using it as, as not a, as the, the use that we're considering or contemplating? Nothing's come through recently on that. I mean, it's been, Every inquiry that we've seen so far has been in within alignment with the use, you know, within the new zoning regulations that are on that process, property. Because we have to recall too that zoning was changed to allow for data centers, and you know, the it's now zoned appropriately for what the intended use is. And we have not seen any applications or any inquiries come in that are inconsistent with that recently. Any other any other city updates? All right, we will keep moving. Um, next item, Washington County update. Chris, anything further for us this evening? President Bain and members, I might just let you know that tomorrow at the county board um, meeting, they're gonna be holding a workshop to start to talk about the um, American Recoveries Plan Act, the ARP money. And I do think that, you know, from the top of my head, I wanna say that the range that the county is looking at um, receiving is a pretty significant amount. It's about $50 million. And so there will likely be a lot of discussion and input tomorrow. And I do feel like there could be some discussion as well as about some additional business grants as, um, as we've done in the past with both of the CARES Act and then the state dollars. And then just a quick um, update for you. I did see last week, the, as the Minnesota legislature wraps up, uh, there was a bill, the tax bill that was introduced in the house that had also another round of funding from the state of Minnesota for business grants. So I think there's more help on the way for businesses uh, although that one has not been approved yet. Um, but it seems like there's some bipartisan support on both the House and the Senate to help the businesses that were impacted and are impacted by COVID uh, going into the future. So, um, so I'll keep my eyes open and report back to you, but just let you know that it looks like there's some additional assistance coming from both the federal government and perhaps the state as well. Thank you for that, Chris. Any questions for Chris this evening? All right. Nanette, you're up. Of course, like Chamber of Commerce update. Of course, like Area Chamber of Commerce update. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you, uh, President Bain and members of the EDA. Um, we just wrapped up our exciting spring fling, which was a shop local campaign, primarily a, um, a social media and marketing campaign, but 
Uh, we involved uh, 20 local businesses and did, <clears throat> excuse me, all kinds of different things uh, just to encourage folks to get out and shop and do some family friendly um, types of activities. And so today was our final uh, push on that. We did our drawings for our winners. And so it was just to see, fun to see people out and engaging within the community. <clears throat> and of course we spread it out over a week uh, so that we were able to maintain that, um, the numbers and those kinds of things. Uh, the other thing that I'll report is that I am seeing uh, new businesses. I have new businesses reaching out for just general information about how to go about things as well as um, opening new businesses opening and new chamber members. And so uh, that to me is extremely encouraging and uplifting. So love to see that. Um, and then within our chamber membership too, I'd like to report that, uh, you know, we're starting to do some smaller scale face-to-face uh, -face hybrid types of activities. And those are uh, being met with great response. I think folks are ready to, um, to get out and about and to uh, start interacting and um, seeing other humans. And I know there's a few on this meeting that feel the same way. Um, and then lastly, I thought I would report that um, just from the Minnesota change from our statewide um, area, I thought this was interesting that there were three really big concerns that came about from uh, business um, across the state. So this is statewide. And that is uh, number one, finding good employees or finding, finding the, the right folks for the right jobs. And so I think we're going to continue to see that as an issue, uh, particularly since the job pool or the worker pool has um, decreased. Increased, and so that's one concern. The second um, that I didn't think about because I'm not in that, that category, but that is I'm um, finding consistent daycare. And so when we have issues, whether um, school or you know um, increased cases or anything like that, um, having consistent daycare for our workers is creating uh, quite a bit of an issue. And then the last one is housing. And so let's just say we brought in local business right to that. I was just thinking about the, um, the, the technology corridor and we bring people in, uh, housing is an issue, which I think um, that's, that's pretty standard across, across the board anyway. But, um, but finding, when we're drawing people into the area, then where are they gonna live? And so those are the top three um, statewide. Those are the issues that business folks are concerned about. So with that, that's it. Thank you. It's great feedback. And any questions for Nanette this evening? All right. We are at the planned end of our planned agenda. Any other comments or I, otherwise I am willing to entertain our Jenny, go ahead. Jenny, there's uh, two, two things um, I'd like to get on the schedule or I don't know how you approach it. Uh, one is um, I was talking again with somebody who's lived in the area 60 years and thought Clear Lake was Forest Lake. Can we get it on the agenda to, to get somebody to get a quote on signs that have the EDA fund a sign that says Clear Lake along the freeway? And the other is we had talked over a year ago, a couple of years ago, about meeting on a regular basis with the planning committee. So we both knew what each other were doing. Uh, we've never done that. Can we address that and get that going? So we sure can. I can. Um, I can speak to the planning commission, and actually, we can. I can work with Dan and Patrick on what, when, in the upcoming kind of cycle of meetings, makes sense for a joint session. Um, when you think about that joint session, is there a that is a, so large, large format? We're talking about you know probably a, a working group about twenty. What, any suggested agenda items you would like to have on that meeting? When we talked before, it's the need of the EDA to know what's going on, what planning is working on, because it helps us. And they so should and, know. And, what, and uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. It would be helpful if we were of the same mind or, you know, knew what was going on. So, um, much of what the much of the planning commission's agenda is project based, you know, on what is, um, you know, what projects are in queue. I wonder if you are, if, it, if a planning workshop is what you're looking for with the actual planning commission, or if just sitting down and doing a broader discovery session or discussion session with both Donovan and Ryan um, might even be more illustrative for you because that would give you kind of a deeper look into the pipeline. Um, planning commission is gonna see what's on their active agenda, but 
between Donovan and Ryan, they could probably give you a little bit of a bigger picture perspective or a longer term perspective. Um, and maybe both, Dan, I think you've got your finger up. Did you have yeah, a thought? Say, just to kind of build off what President Bain was saying there is that that's also one of the intent of the city updates is that I do reach out to Donovan to see what is on the planning commission, sort of what are their issues? Because the what happens though, sometimes these things can be long, long, they have a long lead time before they come to action items. So, you know, what he'll, the update he'll give me in May, sometimes will still be the same update in August because there hasn't been a whole lot of movement outside of some, you know, some, site changes, whatever, but the project itself, the overall dynamics have not changed that much from an outsider's perspective. So we, I do try to bring those projects so the, the EDA is aware of what's happening on the Planning Commission. It's fairly 20,000 foot level though. It's not necessarily all the way down into, into the weeds, but I think the intent is that the, if it's brought forward to the EDA and you want more information, you know, I can direct you to the agenda where that information is or get you in direct contact with the, um, you know, the stat with Donovan who can provide additional detail, but we do try to at least when there are projects coming forward that we can release publicly at the planning commission level, I do try to bring those to the EDA. Um, it's just that they don't change at the same frequency as we do. So our meeting cadence is a little bit quicker than the projects come online. So like I said, the update that I got in March when I looked at it would probably be the exact same update that I bring back tonight because the projects have them have been changed because they're going through their sequencing process at this point. Now, that said, one thing that is coming up on the Planning Commission's agenda is a series of discussions around adoption of zoning changes related to our 2040 comp plan. So when the City Council, and I think there was some updates around the overall 2040 comp plan presented to the EDA during that process about a year and a half ago, um, when that, that the 2040 comp plan was adopted by Council, um, that essentially just adopts the plan, it doesn't do anything to change the underlying zoning. And so then it becomes a staff exercise around evaluation and making suggestions for those zoning changes. Um, I do think that that would be very good for just the EDA to have more background on what does that look like? Um, what does the timing look like? What is the impact? Um, and I know that Donovan has been working with the Planning Commission on that conversation. Um, and maybe that is a good opportunity for a joint workshop, just so you're both learning at the same time. Um, I would have to check with Donovan on specifically where they are in that process and what might be a good intersection point, but certainly something that has impact from a business perspective, as well as all of our land use in the city and just a good item for us to all be aware of. And again, we're not, we're not setting differences in land use it, it's just aligning the current zoning to what is in that, that 2040 comp plan. And some of you that were involved in that process know that some pretty big steps were taken in certain segments of the city that have some pretty consider considerable zoning impact. So okay. might be a little more in the weeds than what you're asking for, um, but um, the feedback is a good one. And, and um, let's kind of constantly look to make that happen on just so you're, you're feeling more in touch with what's happening on the planning commission. Okay, thanks. Member Roberts. So Jenny brings up a good point, uh, but you know maybe, and I don't know how much aware the uh, planning commission is that there is a downtown. Obviously, they know about down com town, town committee, but that we've hired a planning firm to be involved in that, and so keeping them in the loop as to that and getting their their thoughts or insight might be helpful too. Is at some point. Agree. Good perspective. Anything further this evening? All right, not seeing anything else coming up. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. We have a motion from member Lorge and a second from member Roberts. And Karen, could we have a roll call please? Member Roberts. Aye. Member Huntash. I think we lost her. We may have lost her. <laughs> Member Husnick? Aye. Member Finneman? And we lost him as well. Member Lorge? Aye. And Member Erickson? Aye. And finally, President Bain? Aye. And we are adjourned, everybody. 
Thank you for a good meeting tonight. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.